Good morning. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name's Hollis and I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Place and it is a privilege to be able to teach from God's word from this stage this morning. And if I hadn't had the opportunity to meet you, I would love to meet you out on the plaza afterwards. Um, We're continuing in a verse by verse study through 1 Peter. And so if you haven't been here, or if today's your first day, welcome, really glad that you're here. Um, If you haven't been around for a while, I would encourage you to go online, go onto our YouTube channel to catch up. Um, It's been really, really rich, really, really good. And we've had some really good speakers. Of course, Pastor Clay is an amazing teacher um, and he's taught through some tough things um, that have been really convicting. Um, Pastor Sam brought a great message. Uh, Last week, uh, Jim Candy, a guest speaker here, really great friend of Grace Place and Pastor Clay um, taught a message. And uh, when he was doing that, he he showed an illustration um, and he he said that um, um, it was Clay's, how how he had planned out. And um, when he got last week's message, it said brutal. Well, he didn't show what was after that. And if you turned the page, it said good luck. So those are the passages I'm dealing with today. (laughs) Uh, A friend of mine who I have really great respect for um, told me one time, you know, he, he was talking to me about a message that I had given. And I said, you know, it's ridiculous that I get paid to do this. And he said, listen, Hollis, So we don't pay you to use your gift. We don't pay you to preach, we pay you to prepare. And that has stuck with me. And so I've prepared a lot for this message and God has prepared a lot in my heart. And so I'm gonna be vulnerable this morning. Um, So just for as kind of forewarning in that, um, part of the space of, of being vulnerable is I get the privilege to serve with some amazing teachers and um, I have these old tapes that play that would say, I'm not that, I'm, I'm not a teacher. Um, and so, so it, it humbles me in some, in some instances, but then it also kind of takes me out also in some instances on how I talk about myself and talk to myself. Um, so just being real, that's what coming with today. And so if you brought your Bibles or if you have your phone, I wanna invite you to open up your Bible to First Peter, chapter three. So we're going to be in first Peter chapter three this morning, verses eight through 22. Um, So verse eight, it begins this new section in scripture and the letter, the whole letter, first Peter is written to Christians in general and earlier passages, they focus on unique issues and people groups like slaves and wives and husbands. And here, Peter, he starts off by saying, all of you, say all of you, you. say who's all of me, (laughs) it's you. So he's, so he's writing to every believer. He's writing to everyone who would profess Jesus as Lord, everybody who is a follower of the way. He says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Um, I just got back from a a trip to Mexico City. We spent eight, nine days down in Mexico City with the youth, me and myself, and some of the other leaders here at Grace Place. Um, Some of you are right here in the front row, which is awesome. One of the most amazing experiences of my life um, was to be down there with these youth and to experience um, how God is moving in their lives and in mine. Um, and in the church's life down there. And so from Pastor Rodolfo and Lugar de Gracia, that's Grace Place, Mexico City, they send a warm welcome and a thanks for all of your love and for all of your prayers. And I have lots of stories from being down there and as do the youth um, and just you know, stories of how we were able to build you know, relationship with people at the, the hotel that led to redemptive conversation. Um, stories of over 18 people saying yes to Jesus. But one of my favorite stories, something that I will never forget, is on Wednesday night, I did a teaching. And as part of that, um, so when I pre, I, I consider myself a preacher, not a teacher. Um, so when I preach, I, I, I look for spaces to craft moments, um, to craft moments where people can have an experience. And so as part of this message, um, I wanted to play a song. 
And, and then the students were gonna go around and they were gonna lay hands on people and pray with them. And so I get to that point and I get on my knees on the stage and I'm praying and the song's not praying, playing. And in my head, I'm becoming more and more frustrated with the song not playing. And I'm like, what is going on? And I start to freak out a little bit. Then I shut my heart down, my head down, and I hear this murmur. This beautiful murmur of these youth going around and laying hands on people and praying for them. And it was better than any song that could ever played. And it was a song and an aroma that rose up to heaven as these students stepped into places of being uncomfortable but of lifting up their voices and praying over and for people. And so it was just this really beautiful, powerful moment for me. And in that moment, God said, hey, you don't have to worry so much about crafting moments because I got the moments crafted. See, it's not up to me to, to make the moments. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is gonna make the moments. He's gonna do the work. Um, and not just in others' hearts, but in ours and in mine. And so, so that being said, God's been doing a work in my heart as well. You know, a great, coming off a great week and coming back, and this week I've had my motive questioned. I've had my integrity questioned. I've had untrue things said about me. I've had, you know, people speak things without having a conversation with me that just aren't flat true. And 1 Peter 3, 8, coming back to that, it says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. And so I'm gonna be real with you. So I have to be able to teach from this stage from a place of integrity. So that's not me right now. In some spaces, that's me. But the reality of what Peter is commanding all of the believers, that's not me. And so I'm just gonna be real and honest with you this morning as we come into this space that God is working in my heart and so hopefully he's gonna work in your heart as well and he, Holy Spirit is going to say to you what he has for you this morning, but we're working on it together. This letter has been super convicting to me. First Peter, reading the whole thing and also in preparing for it. And convicting is like a Christian way of saying the God's kicking your butt with it. That's the Christian way of saying that. And well, I, I could say that differently, but. And so God has been kicking my butt in this and I've felt a lot of conviction in a lot of areas of my life. So every Christ follower is called to obey these five commands as we live in Christian fellowship and community with one another. Okay, so that's, that's important to understand. We, as believers, those who profess Jesus as king, as lord, as ruler of their life, are a fellowship, are a body of believers, and this letter is written specifically to people who follow the way. And so as we go through one, one, one by one, first it says be like-minded. Be like-minded. United around one way of thinking. Okay, so this is not uniformity. It's being united in one way of thinking, the thinking of Jesus. Two is to be sympathetic. Being stirred or emotionally moved and interested in the feelings of other believers. It's not being callous with their feelings, not being callous with where they are. Third, it's the greatest command, right? To love one another. Jesus' command to, to love one another. In the Greek, when he writes this, it's, it's a brotherly love, a familial love. And siblings, they don't always like each other, but for the most part, they're committed to each other. They're committed to each other above those who are outside the family. You've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water, right? So, so that's the kind of love that he's talking about here and not being indifferent towards one another. Next is be compassionate. Be compassionate, ready to show each other kindness. It's a desire for the good of the other person and it's not pity. 
Next is be humble. Set ourselves aside. Make others the focus of our attention, not pride. And we could do a five-part series on just these. And the last couple of years, for me, have been really sad as I think about the Big C Church and its leaders in the context of this. As I said, this letter has been super convicting for me. One of my bosses once said, if you got a finger pointing out, you got four pointing right back at you. It's something I've never forgotten. And it's, it's always taught me to say, okay, well, that person said this. That was a lie. This isn't true. That's what this person did. This person did. This person did. But it's like, oh, wait, hold on. In each of those scenarios, I've got these pointing right back at me. I can't fix that. I can't change that. I can't change them. I can't change what they said or what they did or anything else. But what I can change what I can do is I can reflect what is going on in me. What is going on in my heart? What's the conviction there? What's stirring? What is God stirring in me? And more and more, I've been asking the question, is this me? As I look at this verse, is this me? Is this my behavior? If you've heard me preach before, I've talked about you got to stop lying. I say that a lot more brutal to the, to the men when I talk to them. We have to stop lying. Stop lying to ourselves and others. See, if you want something to change, you have to understand where you are in order to get someplace else. And in order to understand where we are, we have to stop lying to ourselves about where we are. See, change isn't change unless something changes. Did you catch that? Someone said yes. Change isn't change unless something changes. And I look at this and I'm like, but, but I don't experience this with my peers. But, but I don't experience this with my other teammates. But I don't experience this in society. And God says, I'm not asking if you experience it there. I'm asking if you're experiencing it here. And when First Peter is writing here, he's not asking what you're experiencing, he's making these commands to us on how to live. So I have to ask myself, what needs to change? What do I need to change in my heart? What is God trying to do in me? And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable and it's frightening in some cases. What is God calling me to next? What is God inviting me into? What is God asking me to let go of? What is God trying to break down in me so that I can experience more of this living hope that I'll talk about that he has to offer? First Peter 3.9 says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. So Peter's talking to believers who are being criticized and insulted by others who are not believers. He says, on, con on the contrary, repay evil with what? Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So a blessing is to speak well of, to extend the prospect of salvation or the favor of God to another person. I, I love that word favor, particularly in the context of thinking about experiencing God's favor, and God's favor on my life. See, the in implied hope of this text is, is that the hope is that those who insult Christians will glorify God on the day that he visits us. First Peter 2.12, Peter writes, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify who? On the day he visits us. See, when we step into a relationship with Jesus, we're called to a new life, not the old life. See, when we, re we repent, when we turn away from our sins, repent is a Bible word that means to make a 180, to turn away from our old ways. See, we're called to become imitators of Jesus, to become imitators of Jesus in the path of peace and non-retaliation. What? Pastor Hollis, aren't we supposed to be warriors for the kingdom? Aren't we supposed to be like Peter and go around lopping off ears? No. Turns out 
Jesus wants us to love other people. Turns out Jesus wants us to walk in the path of peace. Turns out Jesus wants us to walk differently than other people. So when they say something bad about us, we're not turning around and retaliating and saying bad things back about them. Picking up in verse 10, it says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So Peter here, he's quoting David from the Psalm, Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16, to show that God's people have always been called, always been called to reject evil and to do good. And this is true even, especially when you are suffering. When we look at the the letter that Peter is writing here, in, in, in the NIV, the New International Version, that's the version that I'm teaching from today, in the NIV, suffering is mentioned 20 times. 20 times. And so when Peter talks about suffering in the letter, the focus is on the verbal abuse, the verbal abuse and discrimination, not a governmental persecution. It's the verbal abuse and discrimination that believers were suffering worldwide. 1 Peter 5, 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. See, believers would encounter questions and charges because of their faith. Because of their faith, people would slander them. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 14, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. There's this theme of vindication that's introduced in verses 10 through 12 and that dominates verses 13 through 17 and then continues to dominate in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 1 1 1 Peter chapter 4, (laughs) verse 6. It's hard to say 1 Peter a lot really close together and rapidly. But God will be the one who finally vindicates his people, no matter what suffering that they have faced. No man, no woman, no government, no political authority, no one but God will vindicate his people. See, they have nothing to fear from anyone's questions or accusations. In 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17, it says, but in your hearts, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So kind of breaking that down and looking at that, looking at those verses, it says, but in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. First Peter sees the people that he's writing to as being on trial on a daily basis. And when you read this in the context of what the original script is, he's using trial language here. And in general, he's saying, be prepared. Be prepared, be prepared for what? Be prepared. Uh, Sorry, Lion King reference. Uh, Generally saying, be prepared to make an argument to make an argument on your own behalf in the face of misunderstanding or criticism. It says, why? To give the reason for the hope that you have. To give the reason for the hope that you have. See, hope is what distinguishes Christians from non-Christians. The readers of 1 Peter are now set free from their previous ways. They've put, a, put their faith in God. 1 Peter 1.21, through him, Jesus, you believe in God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and glorified him, Jesus. And so your faith and hope 
are in God. See, they're reborn into a living hope. 1 Peter 1, 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a what? Into a what? What? Thank you. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, Jesus Christ took the full punishment for my sin, for your sin, for their sin, to make the way for us to come to the Father. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you, you who profess Jesus as king, as Lord, as ruler over your life, to God. He made the way. He made the way. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. See, it is hope. It's hope that separates them from their pagan neighbors. It's hope that separates us from the, from the world of idolatry. It's hope that makes the difference. It's hope that invites the confrontations that he's talking about. Our hope must be public. The questioners, they must know something of hope in order to demand an explanation. It's not wishful thinking, man, I hope it's going to rain. Man, I hope it's not like Hades hot outside when we get out of church. It's an eager and confident expectation. It's living, it's energizing, it's alive and active in the soul of every single believer. And what is this hope? What is this hope that we speak of? This hope is this, it's Jesus. It's that God so loved the world that he couldn't bear the thought of being separated from you, his beloved son or his beloved daughter, one more day. And so he sends his only son to live a perfect sinless life and then being completely innocent gets found guilty in a fake trial who suffers at the hands of men and is ripped to shreds, who's nailed on a cross. And there he declares to Telestai, it is finished. And he dies on the cross. And if the story ended there, if the story ended there, it might last a generation. It might last two generations. But the story doesn't end there. See, on the third day, Jesus rose again. Jesus came out of the tomb and was alive, a living Jesus. And over the course of many days, hundreds of people saw him alive. And there's written testimony to it. Which means he was who he said he was, the son of God. Which means he could do what he came to do, which is the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of my sin. The forgiveness of my sin that I walk in each and every day. The forgiveness of the sin from my past. The forgiveness of the sins that I'll commit in the future. And the forgiveness of your sin. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, I implore, I want to invite you to do that right now. If you're living a life where you're like, man, what's this hope that this guy's talking about? I want some of that, please. There's no magic prayer. It goes like this. It's simply just saying, Jesus, I come. I don't know what this dude's talking about necessarily, but I need a little hope. I need a little of this freedom. I want to know who you are. And so I submit and surrender to you as the king, as the Lord and ruler of my life, and stop looking to the world to fill this gap. Stop looking to the world to bring me hope. So Holy Spirit, come and fill me. I surrender to you and say yes to being obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to invite you to have a conversation with me or one of the pastors or prayer partners after service. I'd love to have a conversation with you, help you to take next steps into the fellowship of believers. See, our living hope originates from a living, resurrected Savior. Our living hope is Jesus. Our living hope is Jesus. He continues on with saying, but do this with gentleness and respect. I don't know about you. 
but I have not seen a lot of gentleness. And I have not seen a lot of respect. I'm coming up on about two years now, coming up on two years of not being on social media. Um, I, I'll pop on every once in a while to Facebook stalk somebody, um, but that's about it, just being real. <laughs> But, but, uh, but I've not been on social media because what I realized at one point was that most of the people I'm friends with on Facebook are people who profess Jesus as Lord. They're people who profess to follow Jesus. And what I was seeing in my feed was not Jesus. What I was seeing in my feed was not gentleness. What I was seeing in my feed was not at all close to respect. See, when we're questioned for the hope that we have, we're to do it in a way that is winsome, that's not hellfire in brimstone, and not in a way that's accusing or demeaning, not in a way that's tearing other people down, not in a way that's like, you know, turn or burn. In the name of Jesus, let me hit you with my Bible. Bam! <laughs> Come to the cross. Right? It's not that. It's invitation. It's invitation. It's gentleness. It's respect. It's story. It's relationship. And as I thought about this, I thought about two stories. Uh, uh, during breakaway, I ended up um, going down my son-in-law's part owner in a fishing lodge in Alaska. And they lost their chef, it's a long story, I won't go into all that. But so I went to cook for them. It was some of the hardest work I've ever done, one of the most challenging situations I've ever been in. But it was really good and God really did some work in my heart that, I, that needed to happen. Um, but I also got to see um, how people experience me. And when I got there, the staff was just really super toxic. They, they were not in a good place. Um, and by the end of when I left, um, it was like a radical transformation that they were filled with joy. They were sad to see me go. And um, I, so in situations like this, and there are situations in life where I, I, I don't mind um, when people like call me padre or father or friar or whatever, you know, um, you know, they're play, you know jokingly, plainly. Um, I think it's kind of funny. But so like when I got there, I mean, um, they were irreverent and disrespectful. <laughs> And I mean, they're dropping F-bombs all left and right, which is fine. That's my people. I'm good with that. Um, but um, by the time I left, you know, one of the guys who was the worst, he's like, hey, man, know your audience. The friar's here. You know, uh, it, so it was just, it was really fun to see um, those people, each of them, um, how they experienced me, but not how they experienced me, but how they experienced the hope of Jesus that was in me. The other story that, that I really um, treasure that God gave me the opportunity for is so one of the weeks, one of the clients um, was an early bird. And so uh, he informed me that he likes his coffee at 4 a.m. Do you know how early you have to get up to make coffee for 20 people at 4 a.m.? Because I don't have a little coffee pot. I got a big one. It takes a hot minute. <laughs> So I made sure to have coffee ready for him, which led to us standing around having conversation in the morning as I'm doing breakfast prep and that kind of stuff. So we'd have a couple hours to talk, which led to then him having a conversation asking about the hope that I have in Jesus. I'd love to end that story by saying, it, you know, he came to Christ right there. That wasn't the case, but it was an opportunity for me to invest and engage in a relationship in a winsome and respectful way and to hear his story and for him to ask about this hope and to hear about it in a respectful, winsome way that planted a seed. And that's our job, is to plant the seed. And the only way we're gonna do that, the only way we're gonna do that is with gentleness and respect. 16 says, keeping a clear conscience, which denotes personal integrity before God. Integrity is this, am I doing the right thing when nobody's looking? When nobody's looking, am I doing the right thing? And this is the stance from which Christians are urged to make their defense. In 1 Peter 2, 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. 
when I thought about this, I thought about, so if I were to be tried for being a Christian, could they convict me? If you were to be tried for being a Christian, could they gather enough evidence where they would put together a trial, where they would present all of the evidence to say, yes, you are a believer. Hollis is a follower of Jesus. And, and, and here's the evidence. The NSA is involved, the FBI is involved, the CIA is involved, all the A's and the I's and the whatever agencies and investigators and all of them, right? They come together and they're able to look at your browsing history, even when you hit private, gentlemen. Because that stuff doesn't go away. They're able to look at that and see what are you looking at? What are you searching for? What conversations are you having on the phone? How are you talking about your fellow believers? What are you saying about them? Are you slanderous and libel and gossipy? Gossiply. Yeah, that's a word now because I said it. Um, are you gossiping? Right? What are you reading? What are you looking at? What are the conversations that happen in your phone? They're able to tap in, or your home, because they're able to tap into your phone, right? And listen to what's happening there. In your car, how you drive. They got video cameras that are able to watch you and all of this stuff, right? So they're able to pull all of this information together. Every bit of it. Think about every aspect of your life that you feel like is hidden right now. They're able to bring that all to light. And when they bring all of that picture together, can they convict you, can they convict me of being a Christian? And I don't mean this in a judgmental way of checking boxes. I mean this in a way that says, is love the outpouring of your heart? Is gentleness and respect? Are you embroiled in your sinful desires. Or are you living in freedom and in this hope? Continuing in verse 16, it says, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. See, by observing the good lives or good works of believers, of followers of Jesus, of followers of the way, the accusers will repent and glorify God on the day that he visits. By the witness of the collective, by the witness of those who follow Jesus, People would repent and glorify God on the day he visits. 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that, it's really important, this is not living a life where you're checking boxes, it's not legalism, it's an outflowing, an outpouring of love because of being in a relationship with Jesus. that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify the day, glorify God on the day he visits. And so when I read that set of verses, and as I pondered it and as I sat with it, I noted three things. First, we're to set a good example. And so some of the questions that I asked myself, is my life, is my life a good example? Is the way that I live in every aspect, every area, does it set a good example? Is there a reason to ask? So people, when they're experiencing me, do they have a reason to ask for this hope, about this hope? Is there something different about my life? Or do I look the same as everybody who's around me? Two, explanation. Am I growing in my knowledge of scripture? And not in my knowledge of scripture as a way of saying that it's in my head and I have a book knowledge of it. Am I growing in my knowledge of who God is? Am I growing in my knowledge of who Jesus is in a loving relationship with him so that the outpouring of my heart is becoming more and more like him, following him more and more closely so I become more and more like him and so the love of God is shown more and more through me. Am I growing in my faith in a way that I can communicate why I believe what I believe? Can you communicate why you believe what you believe beyond Jesus went to the cross? I'm, I'm good. 
third expression, gentleness, respect, and clear conscience. Okay, now we get to the good luck part of this message that Pastor Clay said good luck on. And you're gonna have to listen quickly because I'm gonna talk fast because I'm almost out of time. (laughs) All right, so the next set of verses are some of the more difficult verses that are in the Bible. And so when we look at scripture, when we look at this letter, we have to remember that the first Peter was intended to be written in, or written, read in one setting. It's a letter that's written to believers. And so we need to make sure that we keep the whole context, the context of the whole letter in mind. As I studied and did this, I realized that that Peter was in Rome during this time, and it was during the time when Paul would have wrote to the Romans, the book in the Bible that we call Romans, that was another letter that was written and sent to where Peter was. And so Paul, Peter, Peter, Paul, Mary, (laughs) that's, you know, I just dated myself right there. (laughs) So so Peter would have read that letter, and I had this great... um, this great graph that I was going to put up and show you the similarities between these verses and Romans, but I ran out of time and space, so, but take my word for it. Um, so, so we have to keep that all in context. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, okay? So we're looking at a jigsaw puzzle, and when we look at scripture like this verse by verse, we're pulling one piece of the puzzle out or two pieces of the puzzle out, and we're looking at those closely. It is really, 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 really important that we put those pieces back and we interpret those in the context of the whole picture. We interpret those in the context of the the letter, and we interpret those in the context of what God is saying through his word and through his people. Really important, okay? So, verse 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Okay, so this is where it gets difficult. There's 18 different views on this that I could find in my study. And I've been down this giant rabbit hole looking at this and trying to figure it out. I've read it in the Greek, I've read it in the Hebrew, I've gone back and forth, different translations, asking the question, so who is Peter talking to? Who are these spirits? What was the proclamation and where did it take place? And we could spend hours talking about this and here's the reality, we just don't know. We just don't know for sure, right? There's some people who would say he was reading or quoting from a creed, a, an old creed, but we don't know, we don't have that creed so we don't, we don't know, it's speculation. So for me, the view that makes the most sense in the context of, of the scripture, who they're writing to, the, in the context of the letter, who Peter is writing to in that time is this. The imprisoned spirits in verse 19 were those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. So who was disobedient in the days of Noah? Everybody. Everybody except the ones, the eight, who were saved in the ark. And so Noah preached the word of God to them as a good old-fashioned preacher like Hollis, but no one listened. Hopefully y'all are listening. So how could Jesus go and preach to them if he had not yet been incarnated? Well, Peter never says that Christ preached in the flesh. He states, the Lord did so by means of the Spirit. According to 1 Peter 1.11, it says the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing forward when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. In other words, Christ spoke through the prophets by means of his spirits. 2 Peter 1.21 tells us the same story. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, in each case, Peter is telling us that although Jesus had not yet come to earth in physical form, he spoke repeatedly by the means of the prophets and Noah. And and this, I believe, is what's happening in verse 20. So when we look at 1 Peter 3, 20, it says, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So how did Jesus speak to the disobedient men and women in the days of the ark? 
by means of Noah. Noah was the mouthpiece of the Spirit of God. And when we read Scripture, what is crystal clear is that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, was at work constantly. At work constantly in the days of Noah, in the days of the prophets. And so a natural way to interpret these couple of verses then would be that the Lord Jesus preached through Noah to the sinners before the flood came. And all this makes sense when we hop back into the context of our immediate verses. And Peter, Peter, he's encouraging, he's encouraging persecuted Christians to be strong in the Lord by means of the example of Noah. See, they would know and understand Noah. The people Peter is writing to could understand that their tough situation was by no means something that was new. They were not the first people on earth to suffer for preaching the good news of God. Again, so this is one view, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, so I'm not going to talk more about it. I would encourage you to go and do some research on it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about what I know, which is not a lot, but enough to come to my opinion on that. Then moving on to verse 21 through 22, it says, And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the resurrection of who? Who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. See, it was not the water that saved Noah. It was not the ark that saved Noah. It was God who saved Noah. It was God who saved the eight. Do you get that? The water was sent to cleanse the world of evil and sin, but God saved the eight. God saved Noah. Water was the vehicle that carried the ark. It's not baptism that saves. It's Jesus Water is a symbolism of that. Do you catch that? Water is a symbolism of that. And if you said yes to Jesus today, or if you've recently said yes to Jesus, or if you've never been baptized before, I want to invite you. We're going to have a baptism on October 16th. You can sign up for it online at graceplace.org. So we're going to have baptism. It's going to be a kingdom party. We like to talk about that here. But when I think about baptism, I think about it like this. For the, for, the, for the original believers, when they said yes to Jesus and they went down to the water, it was a different kind of party. Because many believers would never make it to the shore alive. In Acts, it talks about 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus one day. And those people went and they got baptized. And for them, baptism meant that they could be killed. Baptism meant that they could be ostracized, that they could lose their family. So they're throwing all in. They're going public with their faith. They're declaring, yes, Jesus as Christ, Jesus as the Lord, the ruler of my life. And I'm submitting to and following him and I'm going to be obedient. And so for me, when I think about baptism, I think about it in the context of that, of going public with our faith. And when I think about that, does my life reflect that kind of faith? Or is it shallow? Again, not in a way that's checking boxes, but out of a loving relationship and a loving desire and knowing that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, that Jesus is the life, that Jesus is the living hope. Okay, I'm going to put a bow on that abruptly, land that plane. I'm going to invite you, so uh, when you came in, you should have gotten a communion cup. And if you didn't, um, I'll ask the ushers to come forward, but raise your hand high, please, and the ushers will bring you a communion cup. So I want you to prepare the elements. So I want you to hold the wafer in your hand, Open up the juice and get it ready. And I want to invite you right now to close your eyes. See, many of us 
we continue to carry this burden. After saying yes to Jesus, we carry this burden and many of you I know sitting in this room right now are not living in hope. You're weighed down. So right now I want you to envision a backpack or a bag, whatever, that you're carrying all that junk in. I want you to envision walking into a room. As you walk through the door, I want you to invite you to set the bag down. Because sitting in the room lounging at the table is Jesus and his disciples. And I want you to envision him smiling at you and saying your name and inviting you in and saying, welcome. He doesn't look at the bag that you left at the door. He doesn't look at the burden you carry or the sin that has existed in your life. He just says, come to the table. And as you sit at that table, you begin to feel that you're about to experience a moment of holy of holies, a thin space. And so God, Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it. I like to take the wafer and I like to snap it in half, not all the way, leaving just kind of in half. And two things, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And when I do that, I, I, I remember for me sitting at the table, but then I also remember his body broken and hanging on a cross, broken for me. And as you sit at the table, he takes the cup of wine and he passes it around and each person sips from it. And he says, this is my blood. The blood that will be spilled for you, for me. The blood that will wash away the sins. And it's not my blood, it's his. And for me, I like to take the wafer that I've broken in half and I like to dip it into the juice. It's a way of remembering his broken body on the cross, the blood that was spilled. And Jesus looks at you right now and he says to you, if it was only you, if it was only you, I would still do this. I would still allow them to break my body. I would still allow them to spill my blood to make the way for you to come to the Father as a beloved son, as a beloved daughter. And so Jesus, we come now to you and we remember your life and your ministry looking back. And we remember hope looking forward and help us to live in the hope that you offer through your sacrifice on the cross. May we be a people who is known for our love, for our tenderness, for our mercy. And may we reflect you in every aspect of our life. And so today we eat and we drink in remembrance of you. Let us eat. Let us drink.